today on the Perception in Action podcast. Why did I make the switch in my career from thinking about skill as an indirect predictive process involving internal models to direct perception ecological dynamics? Why do I think the latter is a better approach to understanding and developing skill? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about my new book. Yes, I've written a new book on skill acquisition called How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills. It covers the ecological approach to skill from different angles, including practice design, the CLA, coaching, youth sports, designing technology, injury prevention, and using analytics. So I hope you will consider giving it a read. You can find the book on Amazon or by going to perceptionaction.com forward slash book. Now on to the show. Happy New Year, everyone. In today's episode, I thought it would kick off the new year, which will be the seventh year of the podcast following up on last week's episode to talk a little bit about why I switched sides to the direct perception ecological approach to skill. As I discussed back in episode 300 and a little bit in the last chapter of my book, I used to be a firm believer in the idea of indirect perception. That is the idea that in order to control their actions, a performer needed to integrate and process different information sources in an internal model so that they can make predictions about what is going to happen next. In the early part of my career, I developed several models of this type for actions including baseball batting, catching, overtaking and passing and steering and driving, and landing an aircraft. I also spent a lot of time testing ideas associated with these models, like experts having lower variability, attentional control, automaticity, and priming. But then about five or six years ago, I stopped following this approach and I made a transition to thinking about skill in terms of direct perception and perspective control. I switched sides in the indirect versus direct perception dichotomy I discussed in my last episode. Why? To explain, I want to start by critiquing some of my own work. In a 2002 paper, I developed a Markov model of quote-unquote baseball batting. The model takes into account two offline information sources, or contextual priors, if you will. The pitch count or the number of balls and strikes, and the pitch history, what type of pitch was thrown on the previous three pitches. It combines these in a Markov probability process that spits out a prediction about the next pitch. It predicts which of two possible states, a fastball or a changeup, will occur. For example, and without getting into all the specifics, if the count is three balls and no strikes, there's a high probability that the state on the next pitch will be a fastball. Using this Markov model, I was able to generate predictions about the swing errors that should occur for different situations. Specifically, when the model has a high probability that the next pitch will be in one state and the actual pitch is in another state, the batter should perform poorly. These predictions about swing timing errors closely match the actual errors that occurred when I tested batters in my hitting virtual environment. In 2009, I would go on to add online information sources to this model specifically the vertical launch angle of the ball as it left the pitcher's hand, and tau. So, for example, if the batter predicted that the pitch was going to be a fastball based on the offline information in the Markov model, but then the pitch had a low rate of expansion or or long tau, the batter could change their prediction. Using this, I was able to model when and how successfully batters checked their swings. That is, when they inhibited their swing after it had already started. So, for example, if the Markov model made a prediction it was going to be a fastball, but then Tao said it wasn't a fastball, you would expect to see the batter didn't stop their bat movement very well because the swing was already started when they got the Tao info. So, in sum, this model of baseball batting is an indirect perception model that combines offline and online information. It is indirect for two main reasons. First, the outcome of the model is a prediction about a future event the next pitch will be a fastball. Second, the Markov model is processing and weighting the information based on prior probabilities in a very similar way to a Bayes model. So, without explicitly stating it, I was making the assumption that the batter was not using direct perception. 
That is, the information they picked up from the environment was insufficient. It needed to be processed so that the batter could generate a best guess prediction about what would happen on the next pitch. So what's wrong with my model? Nothing, really. It does a great job of predicting outcomes in simple lab scenarios I was testing, and I definitely got a lot of mileage out of it in terms of publications in my career. But the thing is, even though that's what I call it, it's not really a model of baseball batting now, is it? Nowhere in my model do I talk about the actual action of batting, how the batter coordinates the movement of their different body parts to get the bat to the ball at the right time. It's a model of ball flight perception, not the control of action. This is something that became very apparent to me when I started trying to apply my research in working directly with MLB teams. Okay, so I could talk about the predictions a batter would make about different pitch types and different situations, but how do I use that to help a batter that's having trouble hitting pitches on the outside part of the plate, for example? I couldn't really do much because there was nothing about how the actual swing was controlled in my model. As is the case with the vast majority of indirect predictive models of perception, anticipation, decision-making, etc., there's no real motor control component to my model at all. The output of the model is a prediction or decision that is somehow used to move. When you create a model like this for perception, anticipation, or decision-making, all you've really accomplished is you've moved an event in the outside world, it's a fastball, to an event in the head, I predict it's a fastball. You have really done very little to understand how the skill of baseball batting is achieved. Who interprets or perceives the event in your head? How is the event actually used to coordinate movement? You've just shifted the problem around, you haven't really solved it. So, I was at a loss for how to help batters adapt a skilled motor action because like so many others, I didn't have a model of motor action. Whether it's a Bayes model that predicts whether a serve will be cross court or down the line using the score and the server's body language. Or it's a model of rugby in which a player makes a decision about whether to run with the ball or pass it based on contextual priors about formations. If there's no motor control component that describes how the action of swinging, hitting, or passing is actually achieved as part of the model, then you haven't really accomplished very much. Now you have to explain who looks at your prediction or decision and talk about how they use it, which you really haven't done at all. But can't we just add the motor action part on the end, Rob? After we've figured out all the complicated stuff like predictions, anticipations, and decision making, this is what I used to believe too. I figured that I could just get a biomechanical model of a swing and tack it onto the internal model of pitch prediction, and voila, I would have the complete story. Again, without explicitly stating it, I was making the assumption that the control of action works like the hierarchical business model I describe in my book. That is, the control of movement is just subservient to the higher perception, cognition, and decision-making departments. It just faithfully executes the orders it's given from on high without being involved in any way in generating these orders. Our body is just a dumb servant of the brain. Or, like the analogy I've used a few times before, in my baseball batting model, and similar predictive ones for other skills, we're treating the body like an Xbox controller. Once we predict the pitch is a fastball, we just press the A button instead of the B button, and somehow magically a swing occurs. Simple as that. This completely flawed way of looking at the control of movement, that it is just a subservient process in the hierarchy that can be sorted out later, is something that I began to recognize in my work about 10 years ago, actually. It was actually one of the reasons I decided to pack up and move shop to the University of Birmingham. I realized that I was trying to understand perceptual motor action without understanding anything about motor action. At Brum, I learned on the fly, teaching biomechanics even though I'd never taken the course myself, and being able to interact with motor control researchers there and other places in Europe. The key point I began to slowly realize that eventually led me to jump to the ecological side is that you can't just figure out the action part later. It's a critical aspect of the whole process. The information we pick up and the decisions that emerge, whether I'm going to speed up, cut right, or swing the bat low, depend directly on how speeding up, cutting, and swinging are achieved. If I alter the length of my backswing in golf putting, instead of changing the velocity of the downswing, it changes the information I need from the environment. I need to understand the control of action so I can understand perception, not just vice versa. Also, our body is way more intelligent than we give it credit for. 
By allowing for things like soft assemblies and self-organization, we can easily solve a lot of the problems we spend hours trying to handle with overly complex computational processes in the brain. But it requires having action in the loop the whole time, not just tacked on at the end. And this for me is the main reason I switch sides. Following a direct perception approach involves developing information movement control laws. So in other words, it involves trying to understand the information, the perception part, and the movement, the action part, at the same time. Instead of waiting around what seems like forever for someone to add on the action part of a predictive internal model, we get that right away. It's not just moving the problem with skilled motor action around, it is at least in my opinion, actually getting serious about trying to solve it. Related to this last point, I wanted to end today's episode by addressing another comment I see a lot. That is that direct perception ecological dynamics are just theories of movement and the control of action. They ignore all higher level processes like motivation, cognition, and decision making. While I've hopefully convinced you throughout the podcast that this notion is completely untrue, let's run with it for a minute. Why do we focus so much on understanding the control of movement in ecological dynamics? Seemingly, but not actually, neglecting the higher level, more important things our brain does like motivation, cognition, social factors, decision making, etc. So that ecological dynamics is just a theory of action. Well, the answer for me is simple. All these other things can only affect an athlete's performance if they somehow change movement. Stated another way, movement control is the gateway through which all coaching interventions must pass. Imagine I have a basketball player struggling with free throws. Imagery, meditation, changing gaze behavior, changing their sleep, changing their decision making will have no effect on free throw percentage unless they change how the player's body moves when they shoot the ball. These things have no direct effect on the ball's trajectory. While it sounds obvious, it is a fatal flaw of most information processing theories of skill for me. The vast majority, including a lot of my own work, make absolutely no attempt to explain movement control in any meaningful way. That's just figured out later on in the process after the important stuff is done. As I just discussed a few minutes ago, understanding movement is part and parcel with understanding all parts of skill. It's not just an afterthought we can figure out later. How we coordinate our movement determines how all these other factors, motivation, social, attention, have their influence on sports performance. While obviously in ecological dynamics, we have a lot more work to do to fully incorporate factors like motivation and social things into the theory, they are there. And for me, it's only one that actually is a complete theory for the reasons I've described today. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gone straight away.